there's some information on, um, on the brochure, not the brochure, but the, the background. Uh, my name is David Gerlach, and I'm the founder of a digital studio called Blank on Blank. And quite simply, what we do is we find lost interviews with iconic uh, individuals, everyone from Princess Grace to Tupac. And what we do with that content is these tapes that we find, um, digital recordings, uh, reel-to-reel, uh, things that are just gathering dust. They're valuable. Journalists have them. Uh, authors have them. Uh, radio stations have them. Uh, but no one is being able to engage with this content. And what we're doing is creating something new. So rather than me talking about what we do and what we want to do and what we aspire to do, I'll show you um, a brand new episode that just came out today. It's um, from a 1993 interview with Kurt Cobain, who is the lead singer of Nirvana. And it was recorded by a guy named John Savage, who um, he's been writing about music for about 20 or 30 years, and wrote a story for The Observer, a British newspaper. And he wrote a great piece at the time, and then he held on to this tape. No one ever heard it. He used a few quotes. Nothing ever happened to it. So what I did, I said I saw gold. I saw something that's voyeuristic, a fly in the wall kind of piece of content. But not just audio, how can we make something engaging uh, for people that want to pass around, that people want to watch? Something that's different than just um, someone talking on camera. Um, so this just launched today. And I'm, what I'm very excited about is that it's been stuck on, I think, 368 uh, since 10 o'clock this morning. And in YouTube terms, that means that it's out there in the world. It's still there. There's 272 thumbs up, which means a lot of people are watching it because there's no way that almost, what, 75% of the people are giving a thumbs up. So we're pretty excited that it's being passed around and talked about. Um, so let's see if this works. Did you have um, problems in high school? Yeah. You know, I felt so different and so crazy that people just left me alone. I always felt that they would vote me most likely to kill everyone at a high school dance, yeah. you know? My mother has always tried to keep a little bit of English culture in our family. Like, we drink tea. So it's really amazing what he says next. <laughs> um, long and short of it, it was a great audio recording that had just been sitting there and no one was engaging with the content. So what we did was we created uh, this new piece of digital content. And my backstory is uh, I was a print journalist uh, here in New York, wrote for Newsweek and New York Post and Time Out. And I'd always remember that when I'd do interviews, I'd get these great recordings, and the only people who knew about them were me and my buddies at the bar who said I couldn't believe he said that. So in the back of my head, I always realized all this great content was sitting there. And once I transitioned to television, I worked at uh, MSNBC for Rachel Maddow, ABC News for Diane Sawyer. I saw that YouTube videos were running on air. People were holding up uh, cell phones, recording something. We were airing them. We were doing Skype videos. So I knew that the, qu the physical quality of content, what people would consume, would, had changed. They just wanted a good story. So just because someone recorded something on a micro cassette or on their iPhone, it didn't matter as long as someone got to hear something they couldn't hear anywhere else. Um, so I left ABC at the end of 2011 to launch Blank on Blank. We did some prototypes of video um, remix from audio content, uh, interview with Bono, uh, did really well. And we did a Kickstarter last summer, um, last summer, no, 2012, just to kind of get the word out, get content. And um, PBS saw what we were doing, and we partnered with PBS Digital Studios to do an inaugural series that launched um, earlier in the spring interviews with Jim Morrison, Maurice Sendek, James Brown, Wilt Chamberlain, and we're averaging, I don't know, about 120,000 views an episode, um, which I've been really proud of because this is literally a tape that's sitting in someone's drawer, or an uh, interview like WNYC had uh, with David Foster Wallace, which is on their website, uh, which is a great interview, but you would never find it. Well, we took that, and I think it's up to about 175,000 uh, views already. Um, so we're just entering the second season uh, with PBS, and um, just a little background, someone may ask, well, what is your plan to, be, to grow a business? Um, because I know that we, f we f were founded as a, uh, a nonprofit digital studio, but I was inspired by what Ted had done, um, This American Life. They had created this uh, market for storytelling, first-person stories, but also a business to support it. 
um, and most of you know Ted, they have money coming in from the biggest companies in the world. So how could we tap into that? So we've created the signature series of great content and now I'm talking to all manners of brands and ad agencies because everyone wants to be seen as a storyteller. So can we create something? Um, it's all iconic sports figures. Could we have American Moms on blank? And that's part of the name is blank on blank. So um, sorry it's a little abbreviated and rushed. I had um, wanted you to see this, but this is on blankonblank.org and on our uh, YouTube channel. Um, I guess that's about it. Any uh, questions? Yeah. So are, are journalists the people that you're, are you reaching out to them or are they contacting you and do you buy tapes from them or do you only accept them for free? How does that work? A few things. So we have a board uh, and an advisory board. It's people, uh, yeah. everyone from the general counsel now at Bloomberg um, to former editors and, and writers and journalists, uh, cr people who deal in the space, the bridge between content and advertising. Uh, so we have journalists just call us and say, hey, I have this great stuff. I've been holding on to it. I just wanted to have another life. This is my work. This is my art. I want to see it out there. Um, some writers uh, have new projects they're working on, books they're writing, things that are unrelated to their past uh, reporting. So this is a great marketing piece for them. Um, WNYC was a great case to work with because they have this great archive. They want to reimagine it. They want it to get out there. Um, and for them, we could be a partner to kind of recreate the content. Um, and you know, one of the big things that I want to do is now we're entering this next level, moving from this successful series, is, and there's different revenue coming in. Then I can provide um, you know opportunities for writers and journalists to stay in the game. A lot of our journalists are people who've written for 20 or 30 years. They've been pushed to the margins. They don't know what they're going to do, and I want them to realize they have this valuable. So these archives I have are valuable. So can we serve as a facilitator between, just an example, a digital platform like an AOL? A brand or someone wants good stories. They want iconic people talking about things. They want uh, tea all the time. <laughs> yeah. You know. Although I've never really I've known my it. my ancestry. I didn't even know until this year that that the name Cobain was Irish. Uh, I found out through different phone books throughout America. I couldn't find any Cobains at all, so I started calling Coburns. And I found this one lady in San Francisco, and she had been. Uh, researching our, our family history and we came from County Cork which is a weird coincidence because when we toured we played in, in Cork and the entire day I walked around in a daze I never felt more spiritual in my life I was almost in tears the whole day it was the weirdest thing All right, so race home, watch it. You can read it. You can watch it or re read about it on Circulator. So it's going to be a great. Uh, anyways, um, I'm not really sure where to go with this. So if anyone asks, I think I had a really good childhood I'm until the divorce. And, and please watch it at home. On behalf of CUNY and the internet, I apologize for the connectivity. That's okay. That's, that's um, okay. Uh, because you have brands coming to you now showing interest, uh, was not for profit the right decision? It was the right decision for the simple fact I knew that I knew how competitive working in Newsweek when it was still the old Newsweek and competing with time and even within departments, people didn't want to work together. When I moved to television, it was the same thing. Shows didn't want to work together. So I knew that for me to be aligned with a number of magazines, radio stations, uh, publishers, um, writers, we could be seen as not a threat but a partner to help you stay in the game and create more from what you already have. And that's allowing us now to kind of leverage. It's easier, the long and short of it, if you have a nonprofit, it's easier um, to spin off a for profit than to be for profit and go the nonprofit route. But at the heart is, you know, our altruistic mission is to preserve all these great stories, um, you know, with American, you know, cultural icons and, you know, bring them back to life. What about the illustrations? Have who, who's done that? And so the process we work, um, so for example, uh, I'm working on uh, an episode right now um, with an interview by John Updike and by a, a guy named John Freeman. He's a, a, a writer and he does a lot of profiles of writers and he's finally producing a book from all his, you know, many dozens and dozens and dozens of interviews, but no one really had ever heard it. So we're working together with FSG saying, why don't we create something from this archive? We can create a digital piece like this. So we got the tapes digitized, and then it's literally going through the script, figuring out, you know, transcript, figuring out what's good, what can we do with it. And I work with a number of producers 
who've all you know honed in NPR and you know this American Life world. And once we create the audio piece, then we create a storyboard over it. And I work with a guy named uh, Patrick Smith, um, who's a great animator. And you know we were constrained by budget, like anyone at the beginning. But I always look at um, you know whatever situation you're in, turn it into a positive. And so let's, I said, well, let's keep it smart and simple, black and white, and just add a layer of visual storytelling. And you know, so far, people have been you know, really engaged by it. Hey, this is great. Are there an opportunity for video, like found video? And also, is there any question about who owns like, the copyright? Um, yeah, I'll, the first, I'll answer the second question first. As far as the copyright, when we started, I come from a family of lawyers and judges, and I m made sure, I, let's put it this way, I had lawyers who make, usually charge a lot of money here in the city, upwards of four figures an hour, help me out and figure out what can we do to make sure we're covering all the bases uh, with copyright and libel issues. Um, and so we get a license agreement from whoever we work with, so they still own the rights to the raw interview, and we get the rights to create a derivative uh, work, which would be the the video series, and we also have a podcast and a public radio series. Um, the second question about f forms of visualizing audio. Um, we've done a few. We had a Tim Gunn episode, uh, which is all found archival footage, stuff from archive.org, some Shutterstock B-roll. Um, I'm experimenting with a number of uh, formats, like incorporating stills and graphic text and animation. I mean, personally, I find that every big media company, you know, one that's a couple blocks away from here, ones that are downtown, they're all creating video content, but a lot of this stuff no one's watching. So, and they're putting it up there and it's sharp and it's polished. And what we've tapped into is creating something with a very you know, smart, scrappy organization, things that people are watching and passing around. So I kind of looked at that, um, what could have been seen as a, a hindrance working with audio and, and try to create something uh, kind of unique. Uh, right now, we're by the time what's that, we get a tape or uh, digital files uploaded, I don't know about three to four weeks or so. So it's pr for animation, it's pretty, um, it's pr it's pretty fast turnaround. Um, there, all the episodes are about four minutes or so. But you know, as we grow and have a bigger team, um, you know, it could it could quicken. But right now, we're releasing a new episode every other week, and so PBS has been a great partner because they have a great social media reach. Um, so that's been huge uh, for like this Cobain episode is just kind of taken off today and it's been, it's I think the, other, the question about the nonprofit versus for-profit, we're kind of, I want to be seen as the archive of the American interview. Um, and I think people can kind of realize that there's this kind of, you know, smart nature to what we're doing. So we have, you know, top curators repost and, you know, LA Times of the world and, uh, you know, websites I never even knew existed, who have thousands and thousands of, of readers, so that's been pretty interesting. I don't know, if, oh, there we go. Um, sorry if I already answered this, but um, how did you guys find this content? Was it sort of like you had all this content and you came up with this idea as a way to display it, or did you come up with the idea first and you're now sort of having to hunt for all of these unheard interviews and stuff like that. I mean, it started out, I, knew, I had some things, I had friends who had things, my wife's a journalist, she had interviews that she had gathered over, you know, eight or nine years, and then it kind of just grew through networks, friends of friends. I mentioned the Kickstarter we did, we had um, press, really good press, we were in, you know, Forbes and on the media and Business Week, and then journalists started contacting us, and now that the series is out there, it's just kind of, but we still have to sift through a lot of stuff. Um, uh, but it's, I think everyone's realizing there's a power in the archives, but it's just like, how do you tap it? And it, it's one thing to just throw up a bunch of stuff online, but it's another thing to make it so people can uh, engage with it. That's kind of my theory on, on making archives, you know, bring them to life. Um, my question is, is it, you mentioned that you're reaching out to other organizations and other groups. That sounds like a lot of work for a small nonprofit. Do you have any suggestions on how about how you go about that, and, and what um, are some of the? You challenges should have a very policy? supportive wife. I think is important. Who is both like a, a network, and I mean seriously, like a network around you, people who understand what you're, you know, dreaming about building. A, a board, my board has been invaluable. Yeah, I think you can go two ways with a board. You can go with for a board that can help you raise a lot of money, 
or you can go for a board of people who have strengths um, that can help you do things you couldn't do otherwise. And I went for the latter. Um, you know, people who were in, in, engaged with content and media that things I didn't know about. You know, one of our board members is, um, he's been with The Onion for about 15 years, and he's built up all their really smart video content that they've been creating. So he's been invaluable knowing what it means to actually talk to these people in the ad world and talk to CMOs and talk to people who are, you know, in that sphere and how to like, you know, build a business basically. So, you know, it's been crazy ups and downs, but I mean, I've loved it. I mean, it's, it's amazing to build something and then see people watching it and engaging with it and just, you know, you try things and you screw up, try something else. Um, you know, the only person who knows is you. So you might as well just keep moving forward. You must be rejecting more than you accept to pr reproduce, right? Yeah, I mean, we get, th I mean, I, I... So do you make a, a list of all the other stuff that is interesting, but you didn't do anything with it so that other people can find it? We, we haven't opened up, you know, I, I think I've gone back and forth the idea of just like, oh, we could just put up everything versus like curating what we do. If there's an hour and a half interview, we'll find, you know, five to 10 n minutes that we think is engaging. Um, I mean, I think maybe down the line there'll be some opportunity to do that, but I think where our strength lies is I think there's a power in being able to look into stuff and say, this is something that is uh, um, something you should hear, something you should watch. But yeah, there's a lot of stuff we reject. I mean, I'm, we have a certain aesthetic and a certain kind of look we're going for. You know, and, you know, I want, let's say, I don't want a senator telling me why he voted on a bill, but if he could tell me why he calls his son every morning when he's walking into the Senate chamber or something, or why he ties his shoes a certain way, whatever. Something that's engaging, that can live on, that's evergreen content. That's what kind of stuff, because um, there are enough people, we were talking about Circa, there are reporters out there doing all this stuff about the day in, day out, but what can we can get that's about the American experience that's kind of different? Do you have a list of like dream interviews that you would love to get a hold of that are out there? Well, some of the other projects we're working on is kind of reimagining a lot of, uh, of archival content, stuff from presidents, stuff from presidential libraries. I think that could be really powerful. Um, in the athletic sphere, you know, athletes used to sit down with reporters a lot longer than they, they do now. Um, so there's some kind of iconic, I'm working with one partner now trying to tap their archives um, with, you know, legendary NFL and baseball and NBA players. Um, but I think just the thing that I love is like these interviews where you get to be right there. So someone sat down, the difference, you know, I worked in television, difference between a television interview, which is four minutes, when you just sit in the chair and get it, versus, hey, we're in the back of a tour bus or we're in a bar throwing back drinks for an hour and a half and people engage and they open up. Um, so I guess those are the kind of things uh, that I've been looking for. Um, are there any... So you're getting this massive amount of audio content. Is there anything in those archives that you haven't released, not be for aesthetic reasons, but for privacy reasons, reasons or the implications of what's being said? Or, um, I mean, obviously we don't use anything off the record, and it's not TMZ, it's not Gotcha. I don't want you know, um, but you know there is a interview Jonathan Alter, um, who's a long time you know political reporter. He did a book on Obama a few years ago. And he's like, well, here's my interview. And the CD ran with the book, but you know, that was the only place it ever lived. He said, you know, see what you can do with this. And most of it was very like inside baseball, the you know, healthcare fight and you know, all these kinds of things. But there was this one point where he used the term teabagger. And it was interesting because this was coming out of President Obama's mouth. And this was like before it became this uh, John, you know, John Stewart kind of, you know, Thing, but it was there and it was just him talking about something. It was him talking about dealing with the Tea Party and it was just like a normal term for him to use. And, you know, I went back and forth. I'm like, should we use it? But it's been out there. He said it to, you know, Jonathan Alter and it was on the record and it was in the White House somewhere. Um, so that was kind of interesting. But yeah, I don't want, I want anyone to look and I would never use anything that wasn't, you know, if someone says it's off the record, it's off the record. Um, but, you know, our stance is that the same as a written transcript or notes that a journalist takes, you know, what they said at the time, that was, you know, for public consumption. Um, how do you determine the length of the videos? Is it based on the, the, the story or is it based on 
another factor? Uh, I think we've just kept in this three to four minute for short attention span theater and people, you know, people watching on mobile. And I think we just want, it's I guess what they call it in, in radio world is like the driveway moment. And you just like stop and you listen and then it makes you think, you know, this, this one when you all go home and watch Kurt Cobain later, if you watch it all the way through at the end, you'll, you'll stop and you'll see him inside a snow globe. So that's the part that paused right here. Uh, but that's the kind of length we've gone for. But I think w you know we could package them together for you know broadcast on a certain theme or whatever. But anyway, that's uh, thank that's you very blank much. On blank. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Great. Thanks, David. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, stick around, and grab some more food if you'd like. Meet each other, and uh, we'll do this again pretty soon. Thanks.